Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 178. And on today's show, Jared and I are joined by Aaron Hammer for an awesome show on Happy, Node, OAuth, and a deep discussion around security, specifically talking about Oz, Aaron's replacement for OAuth 2.0. We had four awesome sponsors for the show, Codeship, TopTile, Casper, and Imagix. Our first sponsor of the show is Codeship. They're a hosted continuous delivery service focusing on speed security and customizability. You can easily set up continuous integration for your application today in just a few steps and automatically deploy your code when your tests pass. Codeship has great support for lots of languages, test frameworks, notification services, and they even integrate with GitHub and Bitbucket and you can deploy to cloud services or even your own servers. Get started today with their free plan. When you upgrade to a premium plan, use our code, the changelog podcast. And with that code, you'll save 20% off any plan that you choose for three months. Again, that code is the changelog podcast. Head to codeship.com slash the changelog to get started. And now on to the show. All right, we're back. We got myself here, Jared here, and we have Aaron Hammer back on the show. Now, Aaron, it's been, wow, I don't even know how long. It's been at least a year and a half since you've been on the show. The last time you were on here, we were talking about uh, Node at Walmart and Black Friday, what a triumph that was. So welcome back to the show. Hey, glad to be back. And uh, Aaron, I guess I don't want to do your intro for you, but whenever you come on a show like this, how do you introduce yourself? Oh, it's uh, it got much easier now. Um <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, I'm the uh, uh, the founder of uh, of a very early stage startup called Sideway, um, trying to make sharing conversations uh, more interesting and fun. Um, really early stage, um, and before that, I spent three and a half years at uh, Walmart, uh, leading the uh, mobile web services team, uh, building among uh, other things, um, quite a big portfolio of uh, open source projects for Node um, for building server-side uh, applications. So that's uh, that's kind of where I am. Before that, I spent uh, a bunch of time doing web standards and, um, and working on, on security-related protocols like OAuth. And you mentioned um, you mentioned Sideway, the, your very early stage startup. Is there anything you can mention about that whatsoever? Anything you can share that's uh, kind of secret, maybe no one knows about? Um, well, I talk about it a lot. I just don't write about it a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> basically, um, it's trying to kind of fill the gap between the high noise, low barrier. Um, social media sites like Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest um, where people can express themselves, but it's very hard to find an audience and there's it's very hard to consume it because it's very, very noisy and very low quality, low value. Um, but it's still, you know, there's jams here and there. And on the other side, you have um, the full blogging platforms, you know, if it's uh, WordPress and Medium and, and all those where it's it's pretty tedious and expensive to to produce content. I mean, everybody I know has a blog post idea every day, and they rarely write it. And so, because it's 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 a lot of work. Um, you have to write, then you have to do spell checking on it, and grammar, and then you have to make sure it's linked and has high value and all that. So, what I'm trying to do is kind of like people um, convert conversations into content you know we have a lot of these uh kind of like podcasting but written um and so you'll have a conversation and when you're done with the conversation the transcript becomes um uh, the actual content that you're producing and people can follow the conversation live as it's happening um but then when it's over they can um, read the transcript um, and so there's a lot of work involved in building a new kind of uh, basically chat experience 
that is not optimized for your real-time communication needs, but is optimized for producing a great conversation. Because if you if you look at your chat transcript that you're having, whether it's you know uh, Hangouts or Slack or whatever whatever it is, um, they're pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> so you know they're, they're they get the job done for uh, communicating something in the moment, but if you're trying to read a conversation on those on those tools um, after the fact, um, it's it's just completely um, useless. And so the challenge here is to uh, come up with the right user experience that can basically convert these kind of conversations into really great um, written uh, transcripts. So oh, can, interesting. You know, whether it's an interview or um, more of a town hall style or just a casual conversation. So is this something that you're starting yourself or is this something that you're starting with other people? Um, I Something I started myself. Um, recently closed a small seat round and um, hired um, the uh, my first employee. Um, so we're a team of two now. And, nice. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing, uh, spending most of my time on these days. Um, I'm also doing a significant amount of uh, open source work, you know, keep keeping happy going, and uh, and also doing um, a good chunk of uh, uh, consulting work um, with a, a great company called Neoform. Um, so, yeah, keeping myself busy. Interesting. So, seed rounds... A little bit of side work, a little bit of open source work, obviously, because you can't put that down, uh, especially whenever you did such a good job transitioning happy whenever you left Walmart. What what can you share about uh, your departure from Walmart and just sort of the the I guess whatever you want to share about your personal breakup? I think you blogged about it quite, quite well, but specifically around the community around happy and how well that transition is there any insight you can share with the open source community about that? It, it was pretty clear internally. Um about uh, two years ago, that the organization is is getting was getting to a point where they got what they wanted out of the project, and that the the the, the resource spent wasn't really sustainable at those levels moving forward for this particular project. So basically, the 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 feature set that that Happy was providing Walmart uh, seems to match their requirement quite well. Um, and beside bug fixes and small enhancements, it it was clearly moving into a direction where uh, we couldn't justify having four people full time working on on that piece. And so we worked really hard in order to um, increase outside involvement. And you know it was it was done in in two. Like the long tail and the and the super high quality um, involvement. So we we built a relationship with companies that you know had interest in Happy and made sure that um, they are also contributing resources to the project. And at the same time, we uh, made sure to put a governance model in place that will really um, reduce uh, Walmart's presence um, in terms of control and um, some of the you know, association um, with the project so that p- people outside feel more comfortable contributing and getting the credit that they deserve um, without feeling like now either they're affiliated with a company that they don't necessarily want to be affiliated with or just giving, you know, giving free work to Walmart to ban- then go and boast about. So um, it, this was a, a long process and it was a not just the community process, it was an engineering process because um, in order to get more contributions and diversify your community, you need to have more active developers. It's I'm a big believer in the benevolent dictator model of open source. I don't like other models very much. Um, I think there should be someone in charge and someone could make the the final decision. And if you don't like it, you can fork and do your own thing. That's um, something that uh, actually in our last show... Uh, Jared, you can help me out with this, but Ron, he was like, uh, he was just lamenting on just, just, uh, with open source, how you can go and say, like trying to find who's in charge. And like, he's saying, you know, you can go back and listen to him. He's like, nobody's in charge. And like, ah, how it drives him crazy. Cause yeah. you get, uh, it's good for open source that it is open, but it's bad that 
there isn't really someone in charge that can say like, here's where we're going and, and drive it. Like you said, with the BDFL model. Right. So, um, what, what a few things happened, you know, one happy got too big for me to be the, uh, I couldn't really be benevolent. (laughs) Um, it, it became, it became a huge amount of work. Um, it, and I got to the point where I was slowing things down because we had 30 to 50 modules and I was, basically responsible for all of them and i just it just was too much so um and core happy core got so big that um you know like we had everything inside the 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 router was inside cookie parsing was inside uh, a bunch of security stuff was inside um file processing you know view rendering like all these features and what we did is uh, we broke it up and everything that that could be moved out was moved out so it was it wasn't a question of what what belongs or did not belong in court was can we from an engineering perspective move this piece of software somewhere else and everything that we could we moved out um so we kind of smashed the core framework into a lot of tiny little pieces and then basically said hey who wants what and and in order to to take over one of the those pieces, all you have to do is just kind of show up and start working on it. You know, it, they all had no documentation. So the first thing you do is you go and add documentation and and kind of clean up the code and add more tests and um, show that you're willing to put in the time on the you know kind of annoying pieces, right? If someone is willing to do documentation, that's a good sign that they'll be willing to do the the much more uh, exciting work of writing code. And so um, we did all that. At the same time, we also want to make sure that we're um, welcoming to everybody. So we put in a um, um, code of conduct. We put in, um, we put a bunch of effort into getting um, a more diverse core team. So we recruited uh, prominent community members um, that are not just, um, white men um, in order to kind of change the face of the project. So the project is um, more welcoming to everybody. And and the goal wasn't necessarily to like, you know, have better statistics about how many people are, you know, from different um, backgrounds are participating. It was more that if someone comes in, they look at the, the project page and who are the team, they can say, oh, Ken, well, you know, I, I, can, I can see people like me there i mean i'm not going to be like you know the the first of my um unrepresented group in 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 that environment and um i'm not sure how how actual success we had ultimately in in changing the the percentages but at the same time um i think that that we create a very welcoming environment so that that you know and and some of the stuff succeeded some of it didn't work we tried to do a mentoring program but that is something that we're still trying to get working, but it's so much effort to maintain it that, um, you know, that, that's always tricky. But um, yeah, so we we kind of broke it into pieces, put a governance model that uh, is kind of codifying how the relationship is between the different modules and the different, you know, lead maintainers who are uh, their own, you know, little benevolent dictatorship for their, their piece. Um, so we did put all in place. Um, we got, I think at this point, um, Walmart employees account for probably um, one to four percent of the active maintainers on the on the ecosystem as a whole, um, and that was that was great. So it 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 was a long process, but it was a very planned um, process in order to take something that was very much a, a corporate sponsorship setup and move it into a completely community-based um, environment. And, and we actually uh, recently introduced a sponsorship policy so that um, companies can get their logos and their name uh, associated with the happy module so that they, you know, people who are getting paid by their company to do this work can give some benefit back to their, to their company. Yeah, I noticed in the readme that uh, the sideway logo is there actually, so that there is some sort of sponsorship option for Happy. Yeah, um, that one is funny. Basically, the I kind of calculated and the cost, um, kind of like my lost wages on Happy work every <laughs> month, uh, is between 
uh, it's between three to six thousand dollars a month. Um, in terms of if if I take the hours I'm spending on the project and I was just bill for them at my um extremely overpriced rate. Um, and so I kind of decided like I'm not quite ready to go and get other people to to do the sponsorship. I'm I'm almost there. I'm probably like a month or two away from that. Um. I'm probably gonna wait for another major release, and then um, I'll just say, hey, if if the company wants to put their name on the on the README, uh, get a few tweets um, from the Happy account about the sponsorship, and um, you know, basically cover my my cost uh, of doing this work, then I'm I'm probably gonna do that. Um, just kind of a a two, three months arrangement. Um, but for now, you know, basically when I do happy work that is not directly benefiting my own startup, then it's basically my startup is paying for it right. in a way. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I put that up there. Um, we'll see where it goes. Uh, it's 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 kind of like a, you know, a, a new, new territory. Uh, I haven't really seen projects um, doing that kind of, of uh, temporary sponsorship of open source. That's interesting. I think it's an interesting model. If, if someone that was listening and they were like, Hey, I want to sponsor happy one month or something like that. How would they just submit an issue, get in touch with you privately? What's the best way? Oh, whatever they want. They can, my email is all over the place. They can do whatever, gotcha. you know? Yeah. Any, whatever they're comfortable. Usually companies don't want to be public about asking to sponsor. Um, and so, you know, my email is everywhere. It's Aaron at hammer.io. I mean, if you can't find my email, then you, you probably can't read. <laughs> there you go. It's always interesting to think about the the copyright and the licensing permission that goes into these sponsored community projects, especially one that seemed to like spawn out of Walmart and then become a community project. Looking at your license, it looks like there's multiple copyright holders. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So copyright is really simple. Um, it's Basically, whoever created something has the copyright, and then um, you can't technically ever waive your copyright. You can assign it, and you can kind of like give it to someone else. But um, copyright law is really, really tricky, and also doesn't really matter much because for <laughs> for the most part, you can't really sue people for the vast majority of copyright on code. Um, but the bottom line was um, we kind of asked everybody, and um, we kind of looked at how the BSD license is set up, and if you and if you see the license, it just says that you can you need to retain the copyright statement from any previous code you've used, and you need to retain the terms. Um, you don't have to retain them as an atomic unit. So originally, um, Happy started well, at Yahoo, and um, a lot of the initial code just was was just lifted from the Postmile project that I worked on at Yahoo, and then Yahoo open source uh, before I left, and that was copyrighted uh, to Yahoo. And if you look at the Happy Core uh, license, it's basically saying it's copyright to Yahoo, it's copyright to Walmart, it's copyright to other people. Um, anybody who contributes um, basically has a piece of the copyright, uh, and then by contributing, you basically buying into the BSD uh, license that's sitting there. So it's at some point it became just hard to maintain that list of, of copyrights because every pull request, you technically need to go and add that name to the license. So we just added a link. With, we asked the lawyers and the lawyers said, yeah, it's perfectly reasonable that you, know, you have a link to say, you know, here are the main copyright holders, you know, the vast majority of the code, but then there's all these other people. And so uh, copyright is held by whoever contributed a piece of code. If they work for an employer, then their employer has whatever rights they agreed to. And um, all we do is we just say, hey, all of you are bound by this license agreement. And so when when it's time to decide on a new project, um, like who gets their name on the license, who gets the other contributors, right? That's kind of uh, the main question people have. And to me, it's... Uh, Usually, whoever starts something get their name. So, what everything I started at Walmart, Walmart got their name there. Everything I started um, after I've left got my name on it. Um, if something was started by someone else, then they can choose who they want uh, 
to be the primary uh, copyright holder on. Um, ultimately, it doesn't really matter um, as long as it's not out of control. So I, I would say that if um, I'm contributing significantly to, to something now um, that was started somewhere else, I might go and add my name as another copyright holder because I'm doing significant work. But it's it's kind of more of like a credit for big contributors um, than anything legal. The other contributors clause kind of covers it. And mm -hmm. in practice, because it's only a copyright license um, and it's a very liberal one, it doesn't really matter at the end. <laughs> you can't really do anything about it anyway. Right. Um, yeah. Um, was it BSD from day one? Yep. Yeah, it was It was three clause BSD from day one. Uh, that's the one that the Yahoo lawyers asked to use. And since that was the one, you know, once you switch to something else, um, and, and let's face it, all the copyright, all the like MIT and BSD and all those are exactly the same. Um, you know, one will give you a little bit of liability. The other one will give you a little bit of, you know, brand protection, but it's all, all nonsense. It's basically do whatever you want, and you know if we yeah. sue you, the the person who has the more more money will win anyway. So, were there conversations uh, at Walmart about licensing, or was it just you know you were trusted to do what you thought was appropriate? Um, we had I had come with the lawyers. Uh, the 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 Walmart lawyers um were focused more on trademark issues than copyright issues. Um, it's you know it's a bigger concern for them. Um, yeah, trademark is uh especially for for a company that's you know basically selling brands, um and is is in business with pretty much every <laughs> every manufactured good, electronic or otherwise, in the world. Um, the the trademark relationships are really um are, are really strict, and so they want to make sure that they're not opening themselves for liability, and they're not um. And that you know people can go out after the fact and kind of like take credit for for the work. So um, what we've done is um, I've kind of worked with them um, and the, the really um, great team, uh, the legal team there. Um, and we basically did two things. One, we made sure that none of the marks we're using are trademarked by anybody else uh, worldwide, so we're not infringing on anybody else's work. And at the same time, we kept everything public domain. So. As a matter of policy, we did not trademark a single happy related um, mark. Now, no logos or names. And so they're basically in the public domain. So in, in practice, everything is just covered by the BSD license. Um, there are no trademarks in happy. It's all just copyrighted stuff. Um, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, that covers the logo. It covers everything else. Um, we even removed like the copyright statement from the website. You know, it's basically the same as every, every all the other licenses. So it's um, it's a little different, I think. Now, um, I think that Happy was the very first um, meaningful open source project done at Walmart, and so um, the organization was catching up with us. Um, <laughs> We were basically doing things, and after the fact, they came and said, oh, I guess we're doing open source now, so maybe we should have a policy <laughs> about it. And so right. we, um, as, as a general, the, the, the team I was part of, um, I can say it freely now because pretty much everybody that is relevant has left um, as well um, over the last year. But basically, uh, we were kind of like, you know, uh, do and ask forgiveness kind of attitude versus first, you know, go through the entire corporate ladder and make sure it's uh, it's all approved. Um, but in practice, um, I, Mike, I had extensive um, engineering IP experience. Uh, you know, I play a lawyer on the internet, and having having done um, three full years at Yahoo, working with a legal team there on exactly this kind of stuff, um, all about you know copyright and patents and and trademarks. Um, I have a pretty solid understanding of it. So whenever we did something without asking permission. The lawyers came, you know, um, semi freaking out about it. And I was saying, oh, yeah, we know here's where we did this. And here's where we did this. And here's what the policy. And they were like, oh, uh, I guess you know everything about this already. <laughs> um, and so that was really helpful. It, it, it really helped create uh, the kind of trust that um, that they needed in order to feel comfortable that we're not doing something, you know, particularly stupid. stupid. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, which made things really easy, um, and that's kind of like an advice for everybody who wants to game the system, 
is um, <laughs> if you fork something with a license, you're basically make you you you're making yourself life you're making yourself sorry you're making your life really easy um, because you can just inherit what's going on there, and the lawyers can't really argue anymore because it's kind of required for you to right. keep sustaining that license. So find yourself a product with very little code, fork it, and then change it to something else. <laughs> but it's like a loophole in, the, in, in all these, these big corporations. Um, and so I know, I know you can't do the extreme, but basically uh, if you join a company, if you, the day before you join, you go and open source a tiny little piece of code and then you continue working on it, then it's much easier to get the legal team to just agree with the terms that you set up there than if you're starting hmm. from scratch. And now you have a so all we a, need a, is a, a bunch of project. shell projects with each license available for forking, and then yes, people can pretty just much. Uh, you need to have fork away the empty, empty folders. You need to have some meaningful some something in there so that when you go to the legal team, because they're you know the 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 big big shot lawyers are not stupid, so they'll say, hold on, there's no code here, so why can you just start from scratch? Right. right. So there there or basically <laughs> is if you are forking a project like Jared said, that's sort of a shell project to for the license only. Yeah, so uh, it's helpful if you're starting from something that it has some meaning uh, and some value to what you're doing. But it's really a great system because because once you once you fork an existing piece of work, um, the default requirement is to just keep that. Because um, switching licenses is is tricky because now you have dual licenses and some code is under this, some code is under that, and nobody likes that. Um, it's also generally easier for most companies to allow you to contribute to an open source project than to open source their own stuff. Um, and so really, if you, if you, instead of creating original work, you are doing a fork or, uh, contributing something else, um, the legal stuff within big companies becomes much, much simpler to manage. So there's, there's a lot of way of gaming the system, but ultimately, uh, if, if you want to make your life easier in, in a big uh, corporation um, being being um, verse in the the area is really important because the lawyers if they feel comfortable then they let you do a lot more. Um, I mean the same thing with security. I mean I did I got yelled at multiple times for posting you know uh, code snippets on on gist um, from like Walmart code like during Black Friday and the infosec team you know immediately found it and freaked out that you know there's Walmart code now being shared and it has port numbers and other security stuff. And so they freaked out oh and, my. and, um, I was immediately called to the principal office and, um, and I was <laughs> immediately able to tell, well, I said, you know, first of all, um, you know, maybe you look up who I am and then they looked up and, like, oh, okay, <laughs> we're using all his protocols for security. So maybe he knows something. And then um, I said, uh, what are your concerns are? And they said, like, you know, you can't publish this and this and this and this. And I said, well, all the ports have already been changed. All the sensitive uh, paths have already been, you know, changed. So basically what we posted is exactly what we're running, only not. And everything and everything that's meaningful for anybody to understand that the internal topology has been already changed uh, in, a, in a random way so that it's not even. And so they, they, they saw that and they were like, oh. I guess it's okay then. And then the next time it happened, they basically said like, we just want to confirm that you did that already on all this stuff, right? <laughs> it wasn't like freaking out. It's just like, we just want to cover our ass that, you know, yes, we, um, we, have, we have told you that you can't post this kind of information and you agree that you didn't. Um, so it's, if you give the, you know, the, a lot of these, uh, these policies are important, but at the same time, the people who enforce them are, sometimes they care more about protecting their jobs than protecting the actual IP or security of the environment. And if you just make them comfortable, then that goes a long way. I'm glad you mentioned Black Friday because that kind of leads us into the next quick topic I wanted to mention. But I do want to take a quick break before we do that. So let's break and hear from a sponsor. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a bit about Node, uh, specifically the, the foundation, the formation of IO and then a lot of stuff that's changed since then. So we'll be right back. Say hello to TopTal designers, our friends at TopTal. 
have done something really, really awesome. They've expanded into a new market. They're talking designers. Top Dot has been known as a thriving network of some of the best software developers and engineers out there. Many of the developers in their network know extremely talented designers, and they've always had this sort of informal relationship with designer involvement in Top Town. They've done a little bit, you know, but it hasn't been an exact, um, you know, product, so to speak, or internal model. And so they've expanded, they've, they've evolved today. Uh, they are extremely excited to announce the official launch of Top Tow Designers. What this means now is the same experience that you've had on both sides of the fence, whether you're someone that's looking for really awesome designers or you're a really awesome designer looking for really awesome opportunities. This is the place for you, not only if you're engineers, but also if you're designers out there as well. So designers, listen up. It is time to go check out toptow.com slash designers. That's T O P. T-A-L dot com slash designers and tell them the change law sent you. All right, we're back with uh, Aaron Hammer and Aaron, it's, it's been a while since you've been on the show. And the last time you were on the show, you were talking about nose performance with uh, at Walmart on black Friday. And that was a pretty interesting conversation. And that, as a matter of fact, um, me and Andrew Thorpe uh, was, was hosting the show then. And Jared, you weren't on that show. So that's a bummer. bummer. Um, but since then, uh, Node was was forked. IOJS was created. The Node.js Foundation was formed, and ultimately, IO and Node decided to reconcile. I haven't been keeping up day to day for the past few months on exactly what's going on there. So, if you know anything, feel free to scold me. But you did write a post uh, that had some pretty clear thoughts from you, and just uh, quote one thing you said was, "For the sake of full disclosure, I'm generally opposed to any foundation." And this was uh, why I do not support a Node Foundation. And this is probably back in that drama days. But what's what's happened since the last time we talked to you around Node that is interesting to you that you like to talk about uh, here on the show? So I think a bunch of interesting things have been going on. One is that contribution and participation has really um, skyrocketed. Um, I think that the drama part um, was... Uh, somewhat necessary given that um you know there there are corporations involved and and legal uh agreements and and copyright and names and all that stuff and trademarks and um it took about a year of this this path um a little little tortured path but it was it took about a year to get to a point where the community could fully own the project um and and kind of set course and decide on the things that that mattered um i i don't like foundations in general i think it's a it's a um <laughs> i think it's a it's, it's just like you know a way for for people to make a living off um corporate money without really adding value um i'm not accusing the node foundation of any of that and right now um you know, most of the work is done by Michael Michael Rogers, who is awesome. Um, and um, in general, Michael gets a blank check from me um, in terms of trusting him to do the right thing uh, for the project and the community. So I'm I'm okay with <laughs> with the current staffing. Um, I don't really care much about the foundation part. I kind of think it's unnecessary, and I personally don't find any use for it. Um, I was doing just fine working with the, the joint people. I, I had great collaboration with them. And if now I have to collaborate with, with someone else, that's fine. Um, the more interesting part for me is the is the fact that the project now has significant amount of contribution and is able to move faster. Um, IO was a good phase as well because it kind of like gave all these new uh, contributors and new core, core members, it gave them a little sandbox to kind of play and mature and 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 grow up and, and understand how to uh, run a project with you know tremendous amount of uh, um, influence and importance um, in a responsible way when IO was going on I didn't really want to touch it because it was like it was just crazy uh, the amount of changes and the amount of, of um, just uh, modification and and um, add-ons and just just noise that was going on was just unmanageable. Um, I can't imagine anybody with a day job that is not full-time working on Node 
uh, core was able to keep track of anything that was going on there. And I think that's kind of a lot, what a lot of people felt. And the people who were using I.O. were primarily the people who either just like the latest of anything and they don't really care much about it, or they just really right. needed the new V8 features, you know, the new ES6 and, and so on. And and that was not available to them uh, in the the 010 um, releases. So now things are kind of different. And I think that uh, version 4 represents a significant milestone for the project. Um, I've been using it for a couple of months now. Um, I'm really satisfied with it. I'm using it for, you know, for sideways, sideways is going to be all starting from Node 4. I'm using Node 4 for another another project I'm doing um, as part of my, my consulting work. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that's what everybody should be. It will take a few more months before some, some big players will um, move their environment to Node 4 and kind of come back and say, yes, you know, we're running it at scale and it's working really well for us. You know, the, the, the kind of, you know, Walmart Black Friday memory leak story, um, we know it's, you know, so there's, there's more of those in there. Um, and so we just need somebody to find those first, uh, or at least give us the, the confidence to know that, uh, the, the, the code base is sufficiently solid that even if there are problems, they're not going to be devastating for you once you reach scale. Um, I don't think we're far from that point. I think we're almost there. Um, but that's kind of where it is. And. As far as you know, I'm concerned. You know, like I moved happy to Node 4. Um, version 10 is um, no longer supporting uh, Happy uh, uh, Node uh, 0 010. Um, it still works with it, but uh, we don't run any tests with it, so um, we are no longer guaranteeing that it will work. And also, we have said that uh, even you know within uh, version 10, we're going to start using uh, Node um, version 4 features in there. So we're going to start using constant let and uh, error functions and a bunch of those features um, that will completely break on on 010. So what are some features in Node 4 that have you excited? I primarily am, I'm mostly excited about just the project using a newer V8. Honestly, um, I'm not one of the those people who are super excited about all the new language features. Um, I'm excited about let and const. Um, <laughs> Just because they finally make sense in terms of uh, um, proper scoping of, uh, of variables, um, but uh, the the other features I don't really care about that much. I'll I'll see how I like them as I use them more. Um, I'm primarily just I primarily just just uh, want to get access to the latest V8. The performance improvement are significant. The um, amount of uh, um, bug fixes um, that are included. The fact that it's um, running the same version as Chrome, uh, which makes it a lot easier for quick testing of things and um, kind of uh, having the same performance profile across the um, client and server. So, and I think those are those are significant uh, improvement. But I also um, I'm glad that the uh, the project is has more people working on it, and so it's uh, the team is more responsive now to issues, um, and it's kind of more um, more democratic now. It's you, you don't need to have. Did you ever um, have any particular issue with with Joint and it's it's uh, the way it kind of helped Node move along? Um, not not really. Um, I I'm a big fan of Joint, and I I felt that up until the point where the foundation discussion started, I felt that they did a, a pretty good job um, leading the project and and. Um, promoting the the values that were uh, of main concern to me, which was mostly stability um, and um, and security and performance, and and those things were working well. Um, I think that there was a lot going on both internally at Joint uh, with a new CEO and some internal changes, as well as around the community with a bunch of new startups uh, focused on Node and trying to um make a living off node as well as more um more of the the big the big players you know if it's uh um, ibm and, and oracle and others like that who start showing interest and it got to a point where um the status quo was clearly not sustainable and i i think that um at that point um joint 
in hindsight could have um, managed that transition uh, better. But um, that said, um, I don't think that you know they were um, completely unreasonable in the way that, that they acted. And ultimately, um, you know, with their new CEO, um, they they came to the right conclusion and they did a, a pretty smooth transition um, to the environment and to the, to the foundation. And at the same time, the, the foundation was set up um, purposely to make it really easy to merge it with, with the IO uh, community so that, um, you know, that, that was all done um, very well. So there's, you know, there you have the typical um, corporate uh, um, flexing and, and kind of trying to um, trying to get the most out of, the most out of the situations for your shareholders and your own your own corporate needs, but ultimately I I think that this this it it took time because it was a it was a dramatic change and people had to get comfortable with it, especially within their their uh, corporate boards. Um, but I I don't really think you know that I, I was an insider and I was I was privy to pretty much everything that was going on from the very very beginning. Uh, I mean I knew about the things going on even before all the other players knew about them, just because uh, I kind of was in the middle and and everybody was was treating me as a as a confidant, so I kind of was able to get a big picture um, a long time ago. Um, and everybody had a great intention. Everybody was you know approaching it from from really um, the right motives and and um, and primarily with the the project well-being in mind, um, you know, reasonable people can disagree. So right. I think that you know the drama played out. Some of it played out because you know people like drama, and so they, it's fun. Um, but ultimately, I don't I don't really I've never seen that as a, as an issue. And and even throughout the process, I've kind of blogged about it and tweeted about it. I've kind of like, you know, everybody, you know, if you want drama, you can enjoy it, but otherwise you can ignore this. It's just noise and everything is good and keep using Node. It's it's still the best platform to use. So, um, no, I don't, I don't have concern. I think for the most part, I've never seen, you know, like companies behave like companies when it comes to open source. I've seen people working for companies um, sometimes making bad calls on on open source policy um you know sometimes your legal team is a little too eager and they're just you know they don't want to take risk um but ultimately it's about uh, making sure that the company understands the value what they're giving up what they're gaining um and for the most part um participating in open source is a huge asset um for for pretty much every company out there I guess when it comes to companies like as big as Dwayne or Walmart, if if for some reason we had the ear of someone inside of a company like that that was like maybe had a and they want to do more in open source but they're not really sure how to approach it. What is what are some I guess now that you've gone through a couple of different scenarios, what kind of advice would you give to corporations out there and how they should approach open source and what they should look at towards value back to them and value back to the community? Uh, open source is, is like any other skill. You need to bring experienced people to the table to help you out with it. Um, companies that have done a bad job have typically tried to do it on their own without learning from anybody's experience and without using other people's help. So if if a corporation has the resources and is, is looking to invest seriously in open source, they should go and bring in someone who is an open source expert, whether they are a policymaker uh, which is the, the, the approach Yahoo took. They brought in uh, someone uh, when I was working there to lead open source policy, um, and he did a great job setting up a good balance between what the company was kind of afraid of and what the engineers wanted to do, and, and kind of where the the um, balance, um, what the balanced approach would be. Um, you can do something that's more like you know what Walmart ended up doing, uh, maybe not consciously, but um, it's about just hiring a few people. Um, brought in a significant amount of open source experience, uh, whether it's you know Ben and Dion or myself or other people uh, to the organization that um, can help them, can kind of hold their hand and say, hey, look, you know, we're going to open source this. This is why we're doing it. This is how, we, we know how to do it correctly to gain value. Um, so these are, these, it, it's, it's the same way that, you know, if you, 
if you have a company that has never done, um, you know, Node before or JavaScript before, uh, you're not going to go and hire, you know, uh, Java engineers and buy them a JavaScript book and say, right. you know, learn this and, and let's build everything in JavaScript now. Uh, that would probably be a terrible idea. Um, what you do is you go and you find people who are experienced in the area and you hire them and then use them to leverage other people and grow. So open source is the same way. It, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a really complex ecosystem, you know, between the tooling and the community and the, and the legal part, and also just managing um, the logistics of an open source project. Uh, you have to understand the cost involved. It's not cheap. And you have to understand the pitfalls. Uh, open sourcing a project that gets no traction is really bad. Uh, it can actually cost you more than if you did nothing. Um, so there, you, you kind of have to understand those things. And at this point, there is plenty of experts. Um, and if you don't have the money to, or just don't want to hire someone just to manage open source policy, hire uh, like you know, go find an, a really successful open source project and hire that maintainer. And, and ask them to be your guide to, to do open source. So there's, there's all these different approaches um, on how you can navigate it, but it's not just a matter of taking your source code and dumping it on GitHub. That is not open source. That is just, yeah. that is just you know, show and tell. Well said, well said. Well, let's take a, another break. Um, when we get back, I wanna dive deep into the, 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 the topic at hand, really. Uh, you know, your thoughts on OAuth and your uh, your replacement, your OAuth replacement, Oz. So let's take a break. When we come back, we'll kick off that topic. Guess what, everyone? We've partnered with Casper, the online retailer of premium mattresses, to give you $50 towards your new mattress. The mattress industry has inherently forced consumers, myself included, into paying notoriously high markups, and Casper has revolutionized the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms, and they pass those savings directly onto you. Their mattress is a one of a kind. It's a new hybrid mattress that combines premium latex foam with memory foam. And the Casper experience was designed with you in mind and optimized for sleep. And this is my favorite part. It's backed by a 100 night, no hassle return policy with full refund and a 10 year warranty. And what's even cooler is how they ship this mattress to you. It comes in a box that couldn't possibly fit a mattress, and when you open it, the mattress unravels for you to lay down and catch some Z's. Head to casper.com slash changelog and use the code changelog when you check out to get $50 towards your new mattress. Enjoy. All right, we're back with Aaron Hammer. And Aaron, uh, this call started as a tweet, I guess, in a way, right? As they all do. As as they all do, <laughs> and and I'm I, I thought I had my notes here perfectly, but I didn't, and I, I I went away from my tweet that I had saved from you. But long story short, you were like you were announcing Oz, and you were saying, "Hey, I don't want to give any talks about Oz right now, but I wouldn't mind coming on a podcast." And so I chimed in and said, "Hey, uh, well, technically the change log did, and me as the change log, and <laughs> and here here we are." So so this is this is pretty interesting. So what? What is happening, I guess, with OAuth 1, 2, and then this road to hell, as you've said, and, and what, what the heck is Oz? So uh, it's actually interesting because uh, a lot of, almost all my cool stuff um, from the last couple of years all came from this, this Yahoo Postma project. Um, and, and Oz is, is also a, a byproduct of that work. Um, I was working on, on OAuth and OAuth 2. Um, I think the the story about uh, me and the um, messy divorce with with OAuth two is uh, well known, and if you don't, um, there's some highly entertaining blog posts and videos online. Enjoy. Um, and the way I looked at it is that um, when I when I stopped working on OAuth two, um, I felt that once I had enough, I, I just spent you know four or five years on on doing that that. Kind of work and i just couldn't take it anymore um uh, but also i felt that the the atmosphere wasn't very wasn't conducive for meaningful 
alternative um, at the time. I felt that um, we we tilted too much to the side of um, convincing people that uh, the security provided by OAuth two was just good enough, and and it was so much easier to use, and so you know so much less developer friction that you know if it's good enough for Google and 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 Facebook and uh, and Yahoo and Microsoft, then it must be just good enough. Um, the problem was that, um, like I said back then, uh, OAuth two is a is an outline. It's not really a useful implementation. You know, if you if you took OAuth one and you did a, a, a compliant implementation to the spec, you got pretty good security out of the box. It's it was it's very hard to implement OAuth one. Um, insecurely in terms of the protocol itself. Yeah, you can always, you know, leak stuff and, and just do stupid things, but um, but the message flow, the the um, the workflow, the the structure of the tokens, all that stuff is pretty solid. Um, with OAuth 2, uh, it, because of all the compromise that were made, it just became an outline, which meant that if you are Google or Microsoft, you can hire um, the best security expert and they can write a great implementation that will be very secure. But if you're not, then what you have is a, a you know, whatever whatever random stuff you end up understanding from it, and you just have a simple bare token uh, protocol where if that token leaks out, then it's game over. Um, and if you look at the implementation, for example, the vast majority of OAuth 2 implementation today um, don't expire their tokens. So you get a token from I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but there's I'm sure if you if you use OAuth two, um, you got an OAuth two token and you cut and pasted it somewhere and you're happy and it's been a year now, two years now, and it's still working. Um, that's that's pretty bad if you think about it. You have this really long lasting credential that has no security attached to it, and if anybody gets hold of it, um, you know, an employee quits a company, they take that token with them, and now they have access to all that data. And you can't even know, you can't even tell that it's them because there's no traceability, there is no uh, binding to the identity of whoever's making the call and so on. So I kind of look at the, the environment and I said, that's not for me. Like I, I'm not gonna use it. Um, and so I started playing with um, two protocols, uh, Oz and Hawk. Uh, if you, if you, uh, familiar with like you know OAuth one terminology, there was the three-legged and the two-legged, um, where basically if it's just client server um, and you're just using the signature stuff, you're not really doing any of the the dance of you know authorizing. It. You're just using it as basically a replacement for basic auth. That was the two-legged use case. And then the three-legged was when there is an app, a server, and a user, and the user is authorizing third-party access. So I kind of split those two concerns. Um, and Hawk is the authentication protocol. It's basically like basic off with digest off. It's just a client-server authentication that's using holder of key principles, uh, a little bit of crypto. Um, if you look at the code, um, unlike OAuth 1, it's super simple. It's basically taking OAuth 1 in terms of the signature and bringing it to the modern era. So OAuth 1 is so awful because it was designed to support PHP 4. And PHP 4 didn't give you access to the raw request URI. So we had to reconstruct it. This is why we're doing all this um, encoding and sorting and all that stuff. It's all PHP 4 fault. Um, <laughs> and at the time, it was a requirement because it, PHP 4 was the only available uh, cloud hosting environment you could buy. And we wanted something that is accessible to everybody. And and so that's kind of where OAuth 1 came from. Um, and so I basically said that, you know, all the principles around it were solid. Uh, you know, they all came from, if you look at the people who developed OAuth 1, uh, some of the best security experts in the world, um, no exploit known so far against it. So why reinvent something if we can just simplify it? Um, so that's what I did with Hawk. And um, that has been published for a few years now. Um, it's pretty widely used. And um, if you're using node requests, you already have an, a, a Hawk client uh, available to you. <laughs> it has been bundled with requests for a few years now. Um, it's a very simple protocol and it works really well for, for client server authentication. And then what Oz does is basically takes that and adds 
the, the whole uh, third party authorization on top of it. Now, in, in the beginning, uh, both of these protocols were part of OAuth 2. So Hawk originally was the uh, Mac token that was supposed to ship with OAuth 2. And when I quit, um, the interest in maintaining that work uh, disappeared and it just died, uh, died in committee, as they say. Um, people just felt that the bearer token was just good enough. And then after that, they kind of decided that the right way to do it is with uh, um, JSON web tokens um, instead of anything else. And JSON web tokens come with their own set of, of security, but I don't find them to be good enough, um, it, to be honest, um, because they're not bound to the request at all. So I kind of looked around and I said, okay, here's my problem. I'm not going to use OAuth 1 because I'm already over it. it you know, it, it, it was great, you know, in 07, but I need something else. I'm not using OAuth 2 because I rather poke my eyes with needles. And so what do I use? And what I did is I basically said, you know, I, I'll take what was good of both of these protocols um, and the pieces I liked. And I'll throw away everything that's just garbage. I'll throw away all the extensibility of OAuth 2 that I just don't care about. Um, I'll throw away all the stuff that is not secure enough, like bear tokens. And I'll combine um, you know, the best of both worlds, the best of OAuth 1, the best of OAuth 2, and produce something else. Now, Oz could easily be a fully compatible OAuth 2 implementation. Um, there's nothing in it that cannot just be an add-on on top of it. But I kind of felt that would be counterproductive because the the OAuth 2 mindset, the culture around it at this point, is so hostile to any meaningful security. Anything that is a little bit inconvenient, uh, if you have to use anything of like, you know, oh my God, I have to use some client code now to make API calls? No, that's that's no longer acceptable. And so you you go to that that crowd and you're not really adding any value because nobody will use it in that context. So I felt that um, instead of trying to stay um, stay committed to the to the OAuth 2 uh, track, I'm just going to throw it out. Um, and so if you, you know, when, when this was part of uh, the original post mile code, it was basically all OAuth 2. So, you know, what is called OS now was just OAuth 2 with a bunch of uh, add-ons, um, you know, the self-encrypted uh, ticket with uh, um, with with, with um, request authenticity and, and all those things were just add-ons. And what I did is I just kind of threw out all the OAuth 2 compliant pieces and gave it a new name. And that thing sat there for a while. Um, I haven't done much work on it for about two years now. Um, most of this code has been written shortly um, after I um, I left Yahoo, um, and the reason why I didn't work on it much because uh, I didn't really need any use for it, and I don't like working in a vacuum where I'm you know developing solutions for um, unknown, soon-to-be problems. And now that I have my startup, I needed something again, and this is kind of why this work kind of got resuscitated, and and I decided to kind of go ahead and just finish it and properly document and all that. So that's kind of why, why it became like news a few weeks ago. Um, but in practice, this was kind of done a long time ago. There's parts of the project that, that like you said, go back a couple of years. So what uh, was just perfect timing, I guess, with your departure from Walmart and, you know, maybe some sponsored time from your current company, which is your startup, that, uh, that this became you know, your forefront attention, or is this just like good timing for you? Like this is a good time to solve this problem. It, it was mostly because I needed something. So I, I said, okay, I'm building this app and I need a security protocol. Um, I need exactly what OAuth 1 and OAuth 2 provide. Um, I don't want to use either one of them. So now what? And it's, it's actually kind of sad that, uh, you know, in the last, you know, OAuth 1 was in 07. So it's been eight years now. Eight years should be, you know, like if, if you look at most other protocols, look at the, uh, JavaScript, look at HTML, look at pretty much every technology over eight years. Um, yeah. Uh, people were kind of like, you know, eager to to change and fix and grow and improve. And this work has kind of been stale for a long time. Um, and so I needed something and I kind of looked at what, what, what are my options? And I said, okay. Um, I started this thing a couple of years ago. Um, I liked using it when it was, you know, in its previous incarnation. 
Um, and I just decided to go ahead and finish it. And, you know, to be honest, like, you know, it, it's, I wrote it for me, you know, like, you know, like I do a lot of happy work and, and that's kind of a lot of the work I'm doing for happy is not for me. Um, you know, I'm just trying to help other people and, and kind of grow a community with, with Hawk and Oz. I, at this point, I mostly care about my use cases. Um, and I'm also, it's a very tricky project to talk about and, and answer question about because you're kind of making security recommendation guarantees, which I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's just the wrong thing to do to advise people on security on unknown projects that I don't understand. Um, so the it's it's a really interesting project right now that there's a bunch of code and stuff sitting there, and when people open issues and asking me really deep questions about you know what how I would recommend them using it, I'm kind of go well, sorry, <laughs> can't help you really. You kind of have to read the code and figure it out on your own, um, because it's these are all pretty complex security issues and the tool is really designed for people who who really understand you know OAuth and these principles well and just want to use something cleaner with the with a different feature set yeah maybe speak to the security aspect a little bit because um like you said you know making security claims is is a big deal and you know one thing you can say about a committee or a working group at least you would think you'd be able to say is there, you know, a, a group of experts working together to come to sort of some, some sort of solution now in practice, you know, that sometimes is successful and sometimes fails miserably, but, um, it's a group of experts. And, uh, I think my first thought when I saw your Oz announcement was Aaron, oh yeah, Aaron Hammer, he does happy JS and he's the Walmart guy that we had on the show. Wow. He knows security. Uh, when I see an announcement of like, oh, I'm replacing OAuth two, it's like, who's replacing OAuth two? Like what? There's this question of authority and and expert uh, expertness. I don't know the word, but maybe just give a little bit of you know background or I mean after reading your code a little bit and reading your your readmes, you know I was convinced that okay he actually knows what he's talking about. Um, but do you have to uh, give authority sometimes, or do you have que people questioning your ability to create security protocols? Um, I mean if if you know my background, you know, and if you look at the um, the OAuth specs, you know, my name is all over it. Um, well, there was the example you said earlier at, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but there was a, the example you had earlier when you were at Walmart with the InfoSec people, you know, badging about the, the gists that you were posting. You're like, well, you know who I am. So you had to throw in, throw around kind of like your, your, uh, your authority there too. Yeah. I, I do it once in a while when, when I absolutely have to, um, <laughs> But basically, um, yeah, it's just like you know, go on the go on Wikipedia and uh, and look up OAuth and then come back. Um, but it's I'm not a security expert. I mean, I'm I'm very well versed in security, and I am an OAuth expert. Um, you know, after spending uh, a few years, uh, you know, serving my time, um, and what is really really key here is that one. Um, I'm not trying to invent anything new. Uh, if you look at what this does from a protocol perspective, it's exactly the same as what OAuth and OAuth 2 are doing. And if you look at the implementation, that's really where the scrutiny should be uh, focused on, mm -hmm. and nobody does that. And and so one of the complaints I always had about you know people saying, oh, is this a compliant an OAuth compliant implementation? And I said, well. On, on, that's a, you look at NPM and you find an OAuth module and it says it's compliant and you're trying it out and working well. Um, that doesn't make it secure because you have to look at the source code and understand how it's operating and where it's storing its information and how it's uh, generating its its randomness and and all and is it actually verifying the nonce or not and is it you know is it if you look at OAuth two it requires a whole bunch of server validation that um, if you don't perform the protocol will still work perfectly well. You know, it, it's not going to fail you. And so it's very misleading to say that a spec is secure. Um, implementation can be secure. Specs are not secure. You know, they're just paper. It's just words. Yeah. And point. so that has been kind of my my gripe against, uh, against most of the, the OAuth 2 and OAuth, and even some of the OAuth 1 um, crowd is that, you know, people are saying, oh, I'm going to pick OAuth 2 and that makes my system secure. I'm like, no, it doesn't. And what I want people to do is to um, 
there's a little bit of protocol. Like you, you, you can look at Oz and Hawk and scrutinize the protocol. Um, it's if you know what you're doing, it's very easy to do. Uh, and and I did have a bunch of, um, you know, the same you know top level security experts that have looked at at OAuth, um, have looked at Oz and 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 Hawk and and gave it their blessing. Um, you know, there's a lot of liability involved in security, so nobody. Will, I'm not gonna put their name and say this has been approved by you know X and Y. Um, but I feel very confident that the, the protocol itself is solid and it's basically identical to OAuth. I, you know, parameter names are changed and you know some of those things are different, but fundamentally it's exactly the same protocol. What's much more interesting and important is the code I wrote and how it's implemented. And I'll give you you know one concrete example. Um, OAuth 2 was created specifically to help Yahoo and Google and Microsoft scale their OAuth operations. That was the main concern they had. The secondary goal was to make it easier for developers to use, but the primary goal for them is to scale it. And what they wanted to do was to make the, the tokens um, self-encoded so that when they get a token, they don't have to do a database lookup to find out if the token is still valid. What they want to do is to decode the token using you know, um, some, some kind of crypto, and then mm -hmm. inside of it, they'll find the information they needed, and that was good enough. The thing is that once you have this kind of design, it's a very, it's a highly scalable design because there's no data center. Um, you don't have to synchronize your storage across, you know, multiple um, locations and all that. So it's great. But now you have credentials that don't expire because if the credential is self-encoded, if the credential itself includes what you need in order to use it, then there's no lookup. Then you can never invalidate it. You can revoke it. Um, and so what they wanted to do is they want to issue short-lived credentials in like Yahoo cases, I think it was an hour. Um, and you can use that for up to an hour, but after an hour, you have to go and come and get a new one. That's kind of where the OAuth to refresh token came in. So if you're using OAuth 2 and you're not using refresh tokens, you're actually doing a really big disservice to yourself because you're issuing these, um, these long-lasting credentials. Now, if you are doing a database lookup for every request, then well, <laughs> maybe you should reconsider that if you have any 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 kind of scale for your for yeah. your authentication. And every API call now has a database lookup just for the for the token, which is um, challenging. So it, if you kind of think about it, um, now you need to have some kind of self-expiring encrypted token. Um, so uh, the JWT work is is doing some of that. Um, but then there's other layers that are missing, um, and I can, you know, I can, like, I can talk about this for hours. But, but basically, <laughs> what I've done is I said, okay, I'm going to produce a token that is self-encrypted, that expires, that can do password rotation, um, that can do all those things, that is going to give you both privacy and authenticity, um, and I'll just do it in a way that is going to be solid. So I, I talked to a bunch of my crypto friends. And I sat with them and I said, okay, how do I do it in the absolute the right way? And what is the right algorithm to use and the right crypto to use? And how do you generate the, the keys and all that stuff? And then I wrote a module called Iron. And Iron basically does that. It takes a JSON object and turns it into an opaque string that is um, fortified. And if you, if you don't understand how to do that, then you can't really properly use OAuth 2. And that's kind of always been my point is that to, to properly use OAuth 2, you have to be a pretty advanced developer and understand security and crypto really well, uh, which most people don't. So what, what Oz is trying to do is take all these great engineering principles and implementation principles and just put them together and say, you know what, let's see, let's forget about this this interop and all this standard nonsense because nobody really cares. When was the last time you were trying to like reuse code across multiple providers? Like, you know, that was like that was the grand vision of like, you know, 2005, 2006, uh, when we were trying to kind of like, you know, make API standards across the web and, and open up the social web walls. And at this point, nobody cares about this anymore. You know, <laughs> it, that's all dead. And so since we don't care about, you know, making sure that the Twitter API and the Facebook API are compatible to each other, and because there's only two of them now and we don't care, you know, when there was like a hundred of them, it was painful. Um, why are we bothering with interrupt? So if you throw away interrupt, now you can do whatever you want. And now what I wanted was a great solution for a JavaScript-based environment that will work well on the server, well on the client, get me all the security I want. And what I want people to do is to take the code I wrote and scrutinize that. 
go line by line and find where I'm doing something stupid uh, versus, you know, here's the protocol documentation and you can kind of like say, oh, here's the flow and this is where, you know, you send the parameter in. Like, that's not really interesting. Um, it's kind of needed just to understand what I'm doing, but it's not really helping you understand if this is secure or not. So I, I think that's that's like a key uh, goal of, of, of this work is that I'm trying to shift the focus from an academic exercise of writing a security specification to a very practical exercise of writing a piece of code that you can reason about in absolute terms because it's a piece of code. It does one thing. And and then you can find out if that is secure as an as a end product versus um, a theoretical um, secure uh, protocol. So you got three modules. You have iron, which you said was the crypto uh, wrong word cryptographic piece, which basically just takes a JSON object and does. I'm, I'm assuming it's like symmetric encryption on it. Yep. Um, just encodes that or encrypts that thing. Then you have Hawk, which is the authentication protocol uh, or scheme, as you call it. Um, and then Oz is kind of the that's the authorization layer. Um, Am I breaking those three out correctly? Yep, exactly right. Okay. So when we're talking about Hawk, uh, one of the things that you say in the introduction to Hawk as a primary design goal is that it simplifies and improves HTTP auth for services that are unwilling or unable to deploy TLS for all resources. And I, I thought, I stopped there for a second and thought, why is this necessary? Can't we just, you know, can't we just be willing and able to deploy TLS and use basic auth? And would that require not having this library? Well, is that just a perfect world looking at it? And, and, and in the real world, that's not the case. Um, so it's, it's part of the answer. Um, so there is, um, there's a really important principle in any secure system. And that's to have um, separation of concerns and layering of, of defenses. Um, mm -hmm. Also known as don't put all your eggs in one basket. And the reality is that even if you are deploying TLS everywhere, you don't have control over your clients. I mean, this, the, 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 the uh, TLS protocol doesn't ensure that the client is doing the right thing, right? The server can make sure that the channel is encrypted. It doesn't know if the channel, if the client is leaking stuff, it has no way of knowing. It doesn't know if the client is properly validating the server certificates, which in most cases it doesn't. Um, yeah. The vast, I think Rails still doesn't validate client certificate by default, if I'm correct. Um, I know Node. Uh, I had to like you know scream and yell for Node um, dot ten to change the default to um, throw on invalid server set assert instead of um, ignore it by default. And so, if you just have to assume that the developer will do stupid things, I mean it's just because <laughs> code does stupid things a lot of time. And is that good enough for you? So if you think about it, in a perfect world where the credential is guaranteed to be sent over TLS to the right server and not leak anywhere, then yes, bear tokens are just fine. But it's never a perfect world. And so you have to ask yourself, should I you know, do anything else? And the reality is that if you're sending a bear token to the wrong server, right? Either it's typo or um, or you fail to check your your uh, uh, TLS certificate. You know, you're on an airport Wi-Fi and someone is basically giving you bad certs, and and you have a, a code that ignores bad certs because that's what most developers do. Because it's like, hey, look, you know, it wasn't working, and I put this ignore, and now it's working. Awesome. <laughs> um, and, and you go on Stack Overflow, see how many people answer questions about bad certs by saying, oh, just add this flag of ignore, um, right. problem solved. And, and if that's the case, then whatever app is not validating properly is not fully exposed because they don't know who they're talking to. So you don't, you don't actually get TLS protection. So I think that's a really important um, um, point to make is that it's just not enough. And... And there's a lot of different ways where you can leak those those credentials. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that without some kind of um, um, crypto 
it's very hard to know that the request came from the right person and, and that it's meant for the right um, server. And it, I, I'm going to try to keep this you know, as simple as I can. But basically, if you think about uh, a, a simple scenario, let's say there's Facebook. And then I have an app. I have two apps that use Facebook to log in into them. Because the, 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 they both use uh, the Facebook uh, token as the authentication key. Because what they do is you go to Facebook, you come back to the app with a with token, and then the app goes back to Facebook and says, who is this token? Uh, who does this belong to? And then Facebook say, oh, it's Steve. Great. Now we can log in Steve. Um, so that, to that, that token is really powerful. What happens if I trick you into logging into my app using Facebook, then I take that ticket that I got for you from Facebook, and I got now go back and log in to another app that's using Facebook to log in. I can now log in as you to the other app. I don't. I can't really attack you on Facebook itself. That doesn't work. But I can now, because those tokens are not bound to any, you know, if you remember in OAuth 1, we had everything had to be signed by both the the uh, client secret and the token secret. In OAuth 2, because there's no signatures, there's nothing that binds the tokens to whoever's mm -hmm. making the request. So I can now trick another app to thinking that I'm you using your Facebook ticket that you gave me perfectly legitimately. And so once you start removing these layers, you have all these outcomes. And, and for example, Facebook has a feature to solve that. When you make the uh, you know the Who Am I uh, API call, Facebook gives you an option to to include with it a hash of I think your client ID or something, and then they'll check for you if the ticket was issued for you. And if it's not, they'll say, Oh, sorry, you're using a ticket that wasn't really a token that wasn't really meant for you. Someone is tricking you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an option. It's an optional argument. And if you look, for example, at the um, I mean, at least last time I looked at the uh, Node um, Express Passport Facebook implementation, that feature is off by default. So you, you get all these details and look, you know, everything I just said, I'm sure most of the audience, you know, has never heard about it and not aware of it and doesn't even know that Facebook has this feature that allows you to protect your app from um, wrong logins. But the whole point is that they shouldn't need to. And if the protocol is, is written correctly, then the protocol might be a little more difficult to use, but at least it does the work for you and it gives you the protection that you need. It doesn't require you to go and invent uh, your own extension. So for example, that extension is a Twitter, in it's a Facebook invention. They added it to the protocol because they had some attacks on on some, um, I don't know if they, whatever they're calling it, the uh, Canvas apps or whatever they're calling it. Um, people were able to like trick one and, and, and kind of like log into another. And I don't remember the specific of the of the exploit that someone found, but that's kind of what what they've done to solve it. And there was no standard for that. So now, you know, a secure Facebook implementation is no longer compliant with any other OAuth 2 implementation because they had to add their own parameter to the mix. So it's that's kind of the reality of it. Um, yeah. Which is why, you know, all this, all this crypto stuff, it, like, it really matters. Um, the other thing is being able to, you know, invalidate these credentials and being able to validate that they're that they were issued, you know, that, that they're still um, that they haven't expired. Like, you know, like all those requirements um, are all implementation details. So, in a perfect world, if your client, you know, to, to your question, if you can guarantee, if you control your client code, let's say you're running your own private client server implementation, so you have full control of your client, you know what you're doing. Uh, it will never run on hostile networks. You're fully checking the credentials. Uh, no one will ever see those credentials outside of you. Um, you know, like if you put all these constraints on on it, um, you don't actually have third-party apps accessing your your API. It's just the, your, just your own software. Then yes, right. then basic off over TLS is just fine. <laughs> all right, that's an excellent answer. <laughs> It's like if you disconnect your server from the network, it's it's completely secure. I mean, it's you know, it um there was a really there was a really interesting debate, um really interesting debate going on uh, on the Express um, session middleware a few weeks ago, a few months ago, um where Express um uses uses an HMAC 
to uh, to uh, hash every session ID so that it cannot be uh, messed with. And you know, all the all the people who play uh, crypto expert on the internet um, showed up and basically said that if you use a properly randomized session ID, it's as secure and you don't need to do add any crypto to it. Um, and that kind of like brought all the same arguments that yes, you know, in theory, of an extremely well randomized, hard, impossible to guess session identifier doesn't need to be, you know, hashed or, or any kind of crypto protection. But it's that's not where the story ends. Um, and there's so many ways in which that can fail. Um, he used the wrong crypto function. He used math random instead of, you know, properly, you know secure crypto generator um or you just don't know it and you kind of somewhere in you fudge in a different identifier because you like to have them sequential um or it comes from a database and the database can be hacked and the, the database id generator can be managed can be changed to be um non-random like there's all these layers so it's at the end of the day when it comes to security it's always you know eggs and basket is what you know the two words you have to like ask yourself no, I think that's a, a strong point, and I think the layering is a compelling argument of why you'd want to use Hawk even in scenario described. Um, we're going to stop here for our final break, hear from uh, another one of our amazing sponsors, and when we get back, we're going to close up this conversation with more on Oz, and we're going to have Aaron describe the protocol a little bit and maybe compare and contrast um, specifics with OAuth 2. So we'll be right back. Imagix is a real-time image processing proxy in CDN. And let me tell you, this is way more than image magic running on EC2. This is way better. It's everything your friend and developers have dreamt of. Output to PNG, JPEG, GIF, JPEG 2000, and several other formats. And if you're like me, and you've ever argued with your boss or a teammate about serving retina images to non-retina devices, you'll appreciate their open source dependency free JavaScript library that allows you to easily use the ImageX API to make your images responsive to any device. Now all of this takes a platform and the ImageX platform is built on three core values, flexibility and quality, performance and affordability. When it comes to flexibility and quality, ImageX has over 90 URL parameters that you can mix and match to provide an unlimited amount of transformations that you need for your images. And they take quality very seriously. And because of their commitment to quality, several top 1000 websites in the world trust them to serve their images. Now, when it comes to performance, Imagix operates out of data centers filled with top of the line Mac Pros and Mac Minis, and they're set up for a completely streaming solution. This means your images never hit the disk. Images are served by the best SSD-based CDN for delivery around the world anywhere extremely fast. And while we're talking about speed, almost all the image processing happens on GPUs. This means transformations are super fast when compared to competing virtualized environments. And lastly, it's all about affordability. Everyone wants to save a buck. That's how the world works. Because ImageX processes close to a billion with a B images per day, they're able to make certain optimizations at scale and pass those savings on to you. To learn more about Imagix and what they're all about, head to imgix.com slash changelog. Once again, imgix.com slash changelog and tell them Adam from the changelog sent you. All right, we are back with Aaron Hammer discussing Oz, his web auth protocol based on industry best standards. Aaron, you said Oz is not a spec, it's an implementation. You don't really care if it's ported to other environments because what you want is an awesome JavaScript implementation. Um, tell us a little bit more about Oz and specifically from my perspective as, a, as an OAuth user, um, I've never written a provider I've dealt with as an application developer quite often. Um, reading through it, you know, on the surface, it kind of does look like OAuth 2. Um, so I know you've done it a little bit on uh, surface at, during the intro, but maybe give us a little bit of a deeper dive into Oz itself. We've talked about Hawk and Iron and the compare and contrast it with 
OAuth to perhaps from the perspective of a of a user? Sure. So um, OAuth two uh, is focused on on two main uh, pieces. One is the um, the authorization flow, which is how do you go about redirecting the user from one place to another to authorize and kind of like move and pass along the necessary credentials, um, whether the authorization code or the, the grant, or, or I honestly don't remember all the terminology I made up for OAuth 2 at this point. And that's one part of what it's doing. And the other part is once you have obtained a token is how do you use that token to make authenticate requests? So those are the two pieces. Um, and in OAuth 1, they're kind of like all mushed together into one, one flow. And in OAuth 2, we kind of separate that. Um, and it ended up being two specs. One was the, the authorization protocol, and the other one was the bare uh, authentication scheme. Um, and then the bare authentication scheme um, was uh, enhanced later on to use uh, JWT tokens. Uh, which are um, the JSON Web Token. It's a protocol of taking a JSON object, which is very similar to SAML principles, um, taking those into creating some kind of credential that is uh, self-describing uh, versus just a random uh, bare token string that you use. So that's kind of what OAuth 2 provides. Um, if you look at the, the, the three protocols that I have, um, I think the parallel would be that Iron is uh, in a way similar to JWT. So it's a it's basically a, a, a token format. Um, the diff the main difference is that uh, Iron tokens are opaque um, to the to the client, um, but they are meaningful to the server. It's basically taking a JSON object, stringifying it, uh, encrypting it, uh, and then uh, calculating a hash on top of that. Um, and then also baking into the structure uh, additional features for expiration um, and um, password rotation, which is really important for proper crypto hygiene. And so, so that's kind of what that gives you. It gives you a, a, a token format that you can use. Um, what Hawk does is take the part that is completely missing from OAuth 2, which is uh, an authentication um, authentication scheme that is using some kind of crypto, um, similar to how uh, OAuth 1 was written. Um, it's basically requiring you to sign every request. So every token comes with a token and a secret. You use the secret to calculate a, a hash and you send the hash with the request. So in, you know, in, in those terms, it's, a, it's very simple. It's basically competing with the OAuth bear token scheme, only it adds uh, some, some layer of cryptography and extra security uh, to the security layers. And then what Oz does is, um, Oz is more of an implementation component versus a protocol component. It's basically taking the elements from OAuth 2. So if you think about OAuth 2, it's basically um, in, in, the, in the traditional OAuth 2 flow where um, you go and you uh, send the user to a page to authorize, they come back with the authorization code, uh, then you exchange authorization code for a ticket, for a token. Um, what Oz does is basically says, you know what? We're not going to tell you how to do the flow itself. Like, you know, we're not going to tell you how to redirect. That's, that's at the end of the day, that's how you're implementing your app. Um, but we are going to introduce um, the, the, the basic um, building blocks. And so the first building block is that the application itself needs to authenticate and obtain its own uh, Hawk credentials. So the same with OAuth where you uh, pre-register your client with the client secret and all that. You do the same thing with Oz. You establish that relationship out of bound. Um, and once you do that, you cannot use your uh, client credentials because basically everything is always Hawk. So if you think about OAuth 2, the first step is you're using basically either basic auth or um, some kind of you know form <laughs> encoded um, credentials to get the initial interaction with the server. In 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 Oz, everything is Hawk, so it's it's all secure from the very beginning. 
And what happens is that the only thing you can do um, with your hot credentials is exchange them for Oz credentials. Oz credentials are called tickets. Um, and basically, it's, instead of calling it a token, it's called a ticket. You need a ticket to get in. And a ticket can be provisioned for either the, the app or the user. So you have two kinds of tickets. The ticket itself is just an, an iron object. So that's kind of where it's using that, that piece. The, the flow is very similar. The user goes, um, the user is being told to go to some uh, server page to authorize access. They go there, and when they authorize access, they come back to the app with an RSVP. And that RSVP is basically an authorization code. It's a, it's a smart authorization code, so it has some stuff encoded in it. Um, and then they go back to the server, and the server can take that RSVP and issue you uh, your, your ticket. It's exactly the same as the traditional OAuth 2 flow. The only difference is that um, OS gives you APIs to build it and doesn't forces you to do any of kind of the redirection or you know which query parameter should I stick the the RSVP in. None of that stuff is is really interesting. That's that's up to you. You can implement any way you want. Um, for example, one implementation I've done doesn't even use those flows. It's just using cookies. So what it's doing is um, you go to a login page and you log in with Twitter. And when you're done, you end up with a valid session cookie on your server. And then what you do is you make a call and say, hey, can you exchange this server, this, this cookie basically, and issue me a ticket that has the same permissions. Um, and internally, it's using all these um, uh, elements in order to do that. Um, and you can see that all in, 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 you know, you can see how it works. There is the, the original uh, PostMile project uh, that was working on at Yahoo. Um, is using a slightly older version of, of Oz right now, but it's all the same principle. And you can see exactly how the flow works there in terms of you come to the website, you log in, and then the, those credentials are sent to the one page app. And then from there, you're just doing um, uh, Oz authentication. Now, Oz authentication is basically just Hawk authentication with two extra parameters, which gives you built-in support for delegating access so you can have one app delegating access to another app if they're allowed to. So that's already built in. And it also gives you um, some support for scoping. So you can scope APIs and it's part of the ticket. Um, so there's all these extra features that it gives you out of the box um, as part of the solution. So that's, that's kind of what it does. It's in, in practice, you can very easily adopt this protocol to be exactly off to um you can use you know iron uh and and if, even use uh, uh oz ticket as oauth tokens that will work just fine um as long as you you know properly sign the request you can use uh hawk authentication as just a valid uh oauth uh to um token type and in fact it used to be that if you you know kind of like google the oauth to mac MAC uh, authentication scheme, you'll find a very old draft that I wrote that was basically what Hawk is now uh, before I quit the working group. Um, hmm. So these are all very old principles. Um, I think the big change here is that I'm shifting focus from protocol to code and, and I'm focusing on this implementation instead of trying to kind of create an ecosystem around it. So has that been successful from the perspective of code review and criticism? Like, have you drawn to your code base the eyes that you uh, have hoped for? Um, yes, for Hawk and for Iron, those two have been thoroughly reviewed and, and scrutinized. Um, less for Oz, mostly because up until a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't even documented. Um, so it wasn't at all accessible. I think that now that it is, it might get some more scrutiny. Um, people have been using it. I'm, I'm always surprised when I'm getting email from someone saying, you know, we've been using this thing and we, you know, in production for the last year and a half, and we have a question about something. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And so it, it has been getting, tr you know, some traction. It's nowhere near the numbers, right? It's like, uh, it wouldn't be even like you know a full percentage you know in comparison to where OAuth two is. It's it's completely insignificant, uh -huh. um, but it's there. And and I think that um, 
if you look at the, the pieces that Oz itself brings, if you look at the code itself that it does, there's not much there. So, you know, if, if, if you accept the fact that, that Iron and Hawk are solid and have been thoroughly reviewed and, and they're all um, basically um, uh, to provide a very strong security in the areas that they focus on, then Oz itself doesn't really change as much because um, it's, it's just an implementation detail on top of the other two. Um, and the flow itself that it's using is basically OAuth 2. Um, mm. So I mean, and if you look at the code, you can basically see it. You know, it's 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 very little code. There's always a nice thing to see for any project focused on security is a small surface area. Now, uh, what does uh, what does success look like for Oz? Like, what's an end goal? What would you look back and smile and say, "I did it." So it works for me. <laughs> well, um, so you've already we're there. You're already there. No, not I mean, not quite. I, you know, like I need I for my. My startup needs to be successful, right? And then I can say, "Hey, look, I have millions of users using my my product, and it's all powered by this." Um, I see. It's to me success. Um, in there's two ways of looking at it. Like, there's there's the success of uh, you know I wrote a piece of software and it's doing what it's meant to do. Um, no known exploits. You know, no, nobody getting hacked because they're using it. Um, it's whoever is using it, it's working well for them, and it's primarily working well for me because you know, I'm putting the effort into it and I need it, and so it needs to provide me with a good solution. At some point, um, Sideway will have a public API. When that happens, you know the 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 test is going to be whether developers are willing to learn a new kind of protocol to work with the API or not. Right, that's a big one. Um, if you know if I put a public API, people are looking at it like oh. Why is not using OAuth 2? I don't want to touch this. It's another one of those stupid, you know, custom-made security thing. I'm not dealing with it. Um, so it's, you know, that's that's another another that will be another test, you know, in the future. Um, and just, you know, whoever is, you know, stumbling upon this and and playing with it, um, and if they like it and decide to participate, that's great. Now, on the open source front, what I really want to get out of it is to kind of give people. Um, a reference implementation that they can then use for whatever they want. It's super easy to take the the pieces, um, you know, as modules or um, or just as code to cut and paste and write your own, you know, awesome OAuth 2 implementation. So if you're looking at OAuth 2 and you're saying, you know, I want all these features that it was designed for, you know, I want these, you know, really strong refresh token uh, um, expressions and I want to have all these uh, self-encoded, uh, you know, tokens and, I, and like all these features that you want, and you can use the building blocks that that these three modules provide, uh, or just cut and paste code from them. That's great. You know, it 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 can make your off implementation awesome, um, even if you're not a world expert on it, because you can you can see how it's done, and you can either reuse it or imitate it. So it's um, the focus really is not on um, on getting people to stop using OAuth 2 and OAuth 1 and just using OZ from now on. It's more of saying, hey, look, here's a bunch of code written by someone who sh hopefully knows what he's doing, um, but, you know, using all these same principles. And you can use it, you know, to learn, you can use it to to imitate, you can reuse it as is. Um, and I think that's that's a more interesting aspect. Because um, yeah. if, if you're, if, if you, you know, it, if you missed it by now, my attitude here is that there is very little value in a standard in this space. There's a lot of value in, in thoroughly tested and proven piece of code. Um, you know, I mean, how many people have read the, the TLS spec and can understand how TLS works? Almost nobody. Um, what you do is you use implementation. And so what my, my, you know, my political agenda here is really to kind of shift the focus from writing security specs to writing fantastic implementations that provide you actual security where we can reason about the the implementation and fix bugs in it um, versus the debate of the you know what what to call the parameter where we're sending it back and forth more doing that's calling it kind of like a uh, that commercial, less less talk, more doing. What's, I'm trying to think of the commercial right now. It's like a Home Depot commercial. I think it's like, Home Depot. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's like more doing. You know, it's like, come on, man. Let's just let's just make this happen. Yeah, well, in yeah, light yeah. of that, uh, 
I was just going to say, can you give us the status as far as like version numbers? Are these 1.0? Are they done? Are there roadmaps? Uh, what's kind of the status of all these projects? I know they're kind of old as far as when yeah, you first started that, working on them. That's but. the awesome thing is, you know, they're all, they're all been there for a long time and they haven't changed. Um, there will be, I'm sure there'll be versions, um, coming, um, iron, it mostly needs better documentation. Um, because it has, I think only like 10% of the features are actually documented in the example on the readme. Um, the rest of them are not documented. It didn't stop people from, uh, from using them in some really smart ways because iron is actually bundled within, uh, with happy. So the, for example, all the happy, um, um, secure cookies are using iron inside. And so that has already been widely deployed. I mean, you can look at the NPM download numbers, right? The, the, the hot code numbers are misleading because it's basically getting request numbers. Um, <laughs> cause it's, it's shipped, it's shipping with requests. And so it's mm. giving a, a, a distorted picture of how many people are using it because it's everyone who's using requests is using, uh, is, has a piece of code of, of Hawk in their application. Um, but Iron is pretty heavily used right now. Um, it's, it hasn't changed in a long time. There is no reason to change it. Um, if you want stronger crypto algorithm, you just configure it with stronger crypto algorithm, even though it ships with pretty secure settings out of the box. Um, Hawk has been, um, has been also very stable. Um, we had no protocol changes, um, in Hawk. Um, Hawk is the one place where there is some interoperability and actually if you look at the uh, port label on the project, it's kind of incredible. It's like already ported to like nine or 10 different platforms. Um, I never talked about the project. I never blogged about it. I never gave talks about it, except for when I gave the, the real-time kind of talk about OAuth 2. Um, and somehow people found that module and adapted it and used it and ported it, which is kind of kind of awesome. Um, uh, Mozilla actually used Hawk as, as one of the security uh, components of the when they were doing identity um, for uh, browser ID. Um, they used that for some of their security. Um, I think they still do. I don't know how active that project is, but I, it, it was last I know they were using it. Um, and so these two pieces are solid. Um, they're very simple. They have great browser support at this point. Um, and they're widely used. The the only piece that's kind of new in terms of uh, outside attention is Oz. And Oz is 1.0. And my guess is that um, if it's going to have breaking changes, it's going to be breaking changes in the Node API, not really in how it works, um, not in the internal structure um, of, the, um, of the tickets. So it's pretty stable now. So I guess uh, now it's about the time we wrap up the show. Uh, Aaron, I think we got a couple of closing questions we'd like to ask our guests. You've answered some of them in the past, um, so we won't ask you the hero question. Uh, but a, a good staple would be if you can help the, the listeners who've been listening to the show uh, know how they can step into Iron, step into Oz. How can they support these projects uh, or even Hawk, you know, what's some of the needs that these projects have that the open source community can come in and, and step in and help out with? I mean, I'm really looking for people to to use it and play with it. And and um, it, it would be great if people who are experts can come in and look at it and, and say, whether publicly or privately, that they looked at it and it looks good. Um, uh, Iron and, and, and Hawk don't really need much at this point. Um, they're used and they're pretty stable. Uh, only occasionally someone will post a question. Um, but I mean, those two, as far as I'm concerned, are kind of finished. Um, on the odd side, um, that's going to get more interesting. So um, if people are building new applications and they're kind of trying to decide what to use OAuth 1, OAuth 2, what, what, you know, run with their own thing, um, you know, take a look at it and see if, you know, if it works for you. And if it does, kind of join the conversation. The, the caveat is that because it's security protocol and, you know, and, it's very hard for me to help people with their own implementation of it um, or how they're going to use it because it's basically amounting to giving them security advice, which is something that I don't do on principle. Um, 
but if people who who feel proficient in that space, who would, if you look at OAuth two and you say, I feel confident that I can go and write my own implementation, then then you would be the right person to use Oz and the right person to interact with with me on the project. And you know, one of the one of the direction that I want to take the project is to have really good story about mobile apps. Kind of that's where my, my next need is. Uh, I think OAuth two does a terrible job with with uh, native clients and um, Nobody really has a good story about native clients. You know, it's all kind of like security theater, you know, like encrypting secrets inside the client and people are like, you know, extracting them and posting them on the web and all this nonsense. So want to have a better story there. Um, so that's going to be the next area to focus on Oz. It's kind of like getting the, the mobile experience uh, figured out, um, how to use the authorization page with two-factor off and all those things. Um, so it's kind of more of a usability perspective of the of the space um implemented through an, a specific implementation cool and our uh our last question i, I think this one is, it kind of depends it's been a while since we've talked to you so it kind of depends on how you can answer this I, I imagine you're still in the same areas of your interests but what's something interesting out there that if you had more time or uh, you wish you had more time to play with like what's on your open source radar um I wish I had time to do more node core work. Um, there's two areas in particular that I find to be absolutely disgusting in node. One is domains, um, and the other one is the HTTP implementation. Um, and I really wish that I had the time to go and um, kind of like take over one of those areas and, and and like you know like rewrite them and submit it back to the to the core team. Um, I think those are two areas where it's going to be interesting. I think the um, a, a kind of more of a meta uh, area right now um, is how the Node community is going to um, adopt all the new features that are available to them. Um, I think that's a really interesting question of as we're migrating people from Node 0, 010 to 4, um, you know, how to to keep the module ecosystem, you know, going without kind of like alienating half the, the, the community because they can't upgrade just yet. Um, so I think that's an interesting one to solve. And then once you have that, like, you know, everybody will have to adapt their style guide and coding convention and everything to use all these new features. So that's going to be, um, that'll be like presenting a whole new set of challenges, um, especially when you're in a, an established community that, that, that does follow strict guidelines like Happy does. Um, you know, for example, we have we have an open question right now within the community is like which you know ES6 features are we allowing people to use in um, in Happy Module? You know, because we do have a, a style guide and we kind of require everybody to follow it. And so, do we allow people to use cons and symbols and let and error error function and promises and so on? Um, because we want to make sure that the code remains readable by the entire community around the project. We don't want to have one uh, one module that, you know, is using feature that nobody understands yet, and so nobody can maintain it now, especially if it's a, a dependency within uh, Happy Core. So those are, those are, I think, the most interesting areas going on right now, and um, if I had more time, I would definitely be diving more into Node Core. To have more time would be just awesome. Everybody wants more time, right? <laughs> Well, Aaron, I want to thank you uh, for joining us for such a lengthy conversation about uh, about Oz and, you know, more importantly, your passion for, you know, solving these problems and being, uh, you know, a leader enough to, to lead us there, but also share it back through open source and just such a such an inspiration for those in the community to, to aspire to be like and to, to lead like. So thank you for coming on the show. I also want to thank our loyal listeners for listening to the show. Without you, it wouldn't be possible. And also to our members and sponsors for sponsoring the show. Uh, the sponsors for this show actually were CodeShip, TopTile, Casper the Bedmaker, which was interesting for us as a sponsor, and also Imagex. And next week we're talking to Matthew Holt about his H2. As we learned with the conversation with Ilya, we can shorten HTTP2 to H2. We're talking about his H2 web server called Caddy. So stick around for that. And uh, at this time, guys, let's say goodbye. So bye. Bye. Bye.